This message has been brought to you freely by Ecclesia Kingdom Movement. To support our ministry and partner with us to increase our impact across the world, reach more people and take advantage of more platforms, we encourage you to consider making a monthly gift of any amount or one-time gift towards the work of the gospel. We'd like to thank you in advance for your support and we value your partnership. us to be in anticipation to just wait on the Lord this afternoon I want us to wait on the Lord um, God has a word for each one of us in here and I want us to be alert so that we can hear what he wants to say myself and sister Enebe and sister Ive went to a Catch the Fire conference in Bath City. We went on Wednesday and it finished last night. It was very good. To be honest, it's the best conference I've ever been to. And I didn't want it to end, but it had to. So even Johanna was trying not to sleep because she didn't want to miss anything. That's how good it was. But then on our way back last night, we left Bath City after 10. And as we were driving, we got somewhere on the M5. Actually, before, before we left, when I switched the car on, you know how the lights come on on the dashboard and then after some time they go off? The light of the battery didn't go off. And then I thought, okay, maybe it'll go off after I've driven for a while and it didn't go off. And as we were driving on the M5, um, the ABS light came on, and then the exhaust light came on, and then the airbag sign came on, and I thought something is not right. Then the lights started flickering, going dim, then coming on, on and on, and I, I was like, Lord, we need to get to Nottingham. We started praying in the car, and we were shouting like, Lord, we need to get to Nottingham. You've got to get this car to Nottingham. And I didn't even know where I was. So if the car had stalled, where do I start? Even if I ring the recovery services, where do I say I am? I don't even know. And we were just crying like, Lord, we have a baby in this car. We have got to get home. But by the grace of God, even some cars were driving past and they, they were flashing, you know, what do we do? We're just trying to get to somewhere where we can ring the services and say this is where we are. So we, we pulled at some service station and then we rang the RAC. I'm with RAC. And this gentleman says, oh, because you have a baby, do you want me to give you a car so you can get to Nottingham and then you can come back for it on Monday or Tuesday? I'm like, no, we need to get this car to Nottingham. So I'm thinking, I don't even know this guy. And I leave the car with him. He could tell me all sorts. This is wrong, this is wrong. And what do I say? I've left it with him. So I said, no, if you cannot fix it, we need to get it towed to Nottingham. And we thank God we had the car. We got towed and we got here around two. So I am thankful to God. I was I, I hadn't even told Sister Anybody that I was speaking today. Then I started saying, I'm, I'm speaking tomorrow. I need to get to Nottingham. <laughs> and I said, shall I ring Pastor Shepherds? And she said, no, don't ring him. <laughs> you know, so thank God for people that have faith. Yeah. What I'm trying to say is, the enemy didn't want me to speak today. So he tried to stop me. There is a word for someone. Grab it. Make sure you grab it. Because he tried. There's a reason that I am speaking on this particular day and you guys are here. So grab your word. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you because you are our Father. And we thank you for the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of revelation, the Spirit of truth. Father, I humble myself before you at this time. I ask that you will bypass my humanity, my intellect. You will just use me as a mouthpiece to speak a word of revelation to people, to speak a word of truth, to speak a word of redemption, a word of peace, a word of salvation. 
a word of encouragement and prepare every heart in here to hear what you need to say. May the word fall on good soil and may you, Holy Spirit, nurture it and it's all for your glory. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. So, I want us to read from the book of Isaiah. Like Pastor Shepard says, I do love Isaiah. One of my favorite books. Um, I want us to read from Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 9. And I'm going to read from King James Version. Are we there? If you're not there, say, wait for me. My take it, wait for you, okay. Isaiah chapter 6. Are we there? Thank you. So I'm going to start from verse 1. It says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. When I read that verse, I, used, I didn't like loud noises. I, I even have some, uh, you know, the earplugs in my handbag. Sometimes when the music is too loud, it used to disturb me. But I thought, there's noise in heaven anyway. I might as well get used to it. If the seraphims cry and then the doorposts move, it's got to be loud. So verse 5 says, Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from, the, from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips. And thy iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here I am, send me. And he said, Go and tell these people, Hear you indeed, but, you, but understand not. And see you indeed, but perceive not. May the Lord bless his word. So I, I want us to focus on this paragraph today. We've heard it loads of times. But I just want us to have um, a clear mind and just see it with fresh eyes of the Spirit and hear it with fresh ears of the Spirit. Verse 1 says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne. I saw also. Usually also is a continuation of something that is happening. That means there are two things happening there. The king has died, but in addition to the king dying, Isaiah sees the Lord sitting on his throne. These two things are happening together. It's like saying, I'm listening to so and so speaking to me, 
but I also did this. I also asked someone, uh, while I was listening, I also asked someone, these things are somehow connected to each other. And I thought, why is there this also in this verse? King Uzziah was one of the good kings of Israel. He had a good reputation and the Israelites looked up to him. He must have given them a sense of security, I would think. And for people that have someone governing them that is a good king, they feel secure. But then it's after his death that Isaiah saw the Lord sitting on the throne. And I thought, could it be that Uzziah, having been on the throne, somehow he blocked Isaiah from seeing God sitting on the throne? Was he so preoccupied with the king sitting on the throne, did he look to the king for everything he needed and he didn't think he needed God? But after Uzziah died, there was an emptiness. There was some void in Isaiah. I, I deal with people that have gone through losing someone they love and it's not nice to feel empty. Some mothers that have had a miscarriage uh, sometimes they just go ahead and get pregnant again. It's like to fill that void, that empty space that the lost baby has created. And here we see Uzziah that after the death of someone that was on the throne, he sees another throne. And I just thought, as human beings, is it possible that we could have our own thrones in quotes that could inhibit us or limit us or block us seeing God seated on the throne. It's just some soul searching to do there. There are some things that make us feel so comfortable and we don't think we need God. Those are our thrones. And then when Isaiah saw the Lord, he saw him sitting on his throne, and he was high and lifted up. He was God. He saw him as God, as sovereign. And he saw that his train filled the temple. The train of his robe filled the temple. Train has a lot of meanings. Train can mean robe, can mean skirt, can mean hem. And clothes that have trains or clothes that have a tail have a lot of significance. For instance, the bride, they do have a dress that has a tail. It is a day of significance to them. It is her day. And even when walking, she walks slowly. This is me. And she has people waiting to her, wait, waiting on her, sorting out that train. And in those days, the kings used to wear clothes that had a train, that had a tail. And it, it is also symbolic of authority or power. And they say when kings had gone to war and there was a king that had been defeated, the king that had won the war used to cut off a piece of the tail of the defeated king, and they used to sew it to their own robe just as a symbol to say, you know, they've conquered that king. So tail is a sign of authority. Even when David was pursuing Saul, we find that in First Samuel, there was a time, no, Saul was pursuing David, sorry. And there was a time that Saul had to follow David when David went into the wilderness. And at some point, Saul was in a cave. David went in and cut in part of the tail of Saul's uh, robe. But David being David, he was very repentant, and he had a lot of respect for someone that was anointed. He went back to him, and he said, you know what, I could have killed you, I had this, he, because that was tampering with the authority of the king, and David didn't want to do that. 
I'm just trying to say the train of the robe, the train of the robe of God has a lot of authority. It means authority. It also means consecration. It means glory. It means worship. And Isaiah saw that the train of this robe filled the temple. And these days, who are the temple of the Lord? We are the temple of the Lord. Just stay with me. And then when Isaiah saw the king, God sitting on, the temp- on, on his throne with the train of his robe filling the temple, he got frightened. And he thought he was going to die. Because in those days, no one saw God and lived. People died. But then before, if he was going to die, before he did that, he realized that he had unclean lips. And he didn't just have unclean lips, but he also dwelt amongst people of unclean lips. This is confession that Isaiah made. Isaiah encountered God and he realized he wasn't worthy of being in the presence of God. And that was the reason why, because he had unclean lips. The word says, if you confess with your mouth, and we see Isaiah here confessing with his mouth, I am a man of unclean lips. And because of his confession we see that a seraphim goes to Isaiah with the call of fire and touches the lips to purify Isaiah's lips. Is there anything that we need to confess in our lives that we need God to touch for us to be purified? Isaiah didn't, maybe he didn't even realize he had unclean lips until he encountered God. I spoke to someone who said they thought they had a white dog until in winter when snow fell and they looked at the dog in the snow. The dog looked yellow. It was the snow that made them see that the dog wasn't as white as they thought. So there are certain things that we need God to highlight to us that we need to sort them out. We may not be aware that we are doing something that is not right. And it is the presence of God that will enlighten us that there are certain things that we need to sort out in our lives for us to carry on with our walk with God. And after his confession we see that the seraphim goes and touches him with the coal of fire and he is purified. Now he is worthy of being in the presence of God after being purified. And then I also wondered, I thought, why would the seraphim go and touch Isaiah's lips? Because usually when we when we, when we hear of God sending envoys to people, we hear of angels. He used to send Gabriel and the other angels to Sarah, no Abraham, to Mary, to even Lot, those two angels that the men wanted to do homosexuality with. And I thought, why a seraphim? Because the seraphim usually just flies around the throne of God. That's what I know. Unless there are some things that I'm still, I'm still learning anyway. So this is what I got from my meditation. Seraphims, as we know them, are beings that ju- are just always around the throne of God. They enjoy the presence of God. They enjoy the company of God. And it is great to be in his presence. You wouldn't want to leave his presence. That's the best place to be. 
Is God trying to say something here? Because I would like to think all of us have encountered his presence and we enjoy it. But what do we do with it? We keep it to ourselves. God is saying, as, a, as much as we love the company of each other, I want you to do some chore for me. I want you to be working for me. Let's not just hang out, but let me use you to go and do things for me. And it is very possible to be in the presence of God, but at the same time to be a servant of God. Not just sit there and enjoy the presence. Yeah. We saw that with Jesus. Jesus was a hard worker. He used to actually sneak out of the crowd to go and pray. In the morning, there were multitudes. As soon as word had been sent to say Jesus was coming, there would be people waiting for him. And the word says he only did what he saw his father do, which means he was in the presence of the Lord all the time. At, and he still worked. Could we be doing something wrong? If we just come here and enjoy the presence and we go and we come back, oh, the worship was great, oh, God moved, did this. God is saying, as much as you love my company and I love your company too, would you please do something for me? That is what God is saying. And then we also see that after Isaiah had been touched, Isaiah's lips had been touched by the call of fire, after he'd been purified, that is when God said, who shall I send and who will go for us? Like I said earlier, his train fills the temple. Train, I see train, God sitting on the throne. It is one thing. There's God, there's train. If someone saw the train, they wouldn't just say, oh, there's a train. They would see that as a part of the Lord sitting on the, tra- on the, on the throne. So his train fills the temple, and we are the temple. His spirit has filled us. We carry God. We have a part of God with us, but it is the train that filled the temple. It's not the head. And that is why God is asking, who shall I send? Even though we carry God's glory, we carry God's spirit, God doesn't make decisions for us. As as much as he loves to fill us with his spirit, he doesn't make decisions for us. We have to make the decision. And that is why we see God asking Isaiah, whom shall I send? Or asking the question while Isaiah was there, whom shall I send? Isaiah could not have, it's possible Isaiah could could just have gone and, you know, enjoyed having been in the presence of God and carried on with his life. But he surrendered and he said, here I am, send me. What am I trying to say? We may have the presence of God, but God will not force it on us for us to go and do things for him. We have to make that decision as individuals. And God is not a dictator. He will not um, impose it on us. We have to make the decision. And if we don't do it, he won't chase us from his presence. Because he is love. He will still enjoy having us in his presence. But there's something God wants us to do. He wants us to go and do some work for him. So, out of having intimacy with God, God is looking for workers. People that walk with him, that dwell in his presence, that understand him. God is looking for workers. This is what I got from this, from the seraphim being sent. Because the seraphim dwells around the throne of God all the time, just flapping the wings and crying out, holy, holy. But God sends the seraphim to go and touch Isaiah.
right. Now, for those that are willing to be sent, those that will say, here I am, send me, I have some warning for you. It's not as straightforward as the seraphim, just going with the call of fire and touching Isaiah's lips and going back to enjoying being around the presence of God. There are going to be obstacles. Let's go to First Samuel chapter 17, verse 28. First Samuel chapter 17, verse 28. May I find a good reader this time, please, to read it for me. <laughs> Pastor Kaf, you laughed. Are you volunteering? <laughs> Are you not? <laughs> First Samuel chapter 17, verse 28, please. Do you want to use the mic? And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. Thank you. There is Eliab. Eliab is David's elder brother. David leaves the sheep, asks someone else to look after the sheep and goes where his brothers were, where the war was. And then David overhears people talking. They say, Saul is saying, whoever conquers this giant, this Goliath, is going to get a reward. And the reward was marrying the king's daughter, Saul's daughter, Micah. And not just marrying her, but he would also be given riches, and all of his family would be exempt from paying taxes. Paying taxes is a big thing. <laughs> I know where I come from in Malawi, when I was growing up, there used to be the, the government vehicles used to come in the villages. And then it was just the men that were paying the tax at the time. Men used to flee into the bush <laughs> when they heard that, you know, the government people had come to collect the tax. And so is offering. Whoever conquers that giant, is, all of his family are going to be exempt from paying the tax. That's a huge reward. And they say Saul was good looking. The word says when he stood among people, he was tall. Others used to reach him around his shoulders, and he had loads of hair. He was good looking. So I can imagine what his daughter looked like. So David goes and says, What are you saying? What are they saying? What are they saying? Did I hear what I thought I heard? And Eliab turns around and said, What are you doing here? Who have you left the sheep with? You're not supposed to be here. And then David says, what have I done now? But he didn't stop there. He turns and he asks yet other people. And he says, what did the king say? David is determined. He's on a mission. And these people explain to David. Because they say Goliath had been coming out and saying, you know, some naughty things against the Israelites, sort of defaming the Lord because he was a giant. He was powerful, and they were scared of him. So these other guys explained to David, you know, this is the reward. Whoever conquers the giant is going to marry the king's daughter, the princess, is going to inherit riches, and the family are going to be exempt from 
paying tax. But then what I thought was, Eliab was supposed to be encouraging David. He was his elder brother. But there he is discouraging him. What are you doing here? You shouldn't be here. You know. But David was on a mission. He knew in whose name he was going to do this mission in. He was determined. He was sent. And as we know, the fight between David and Goliath was symbolic of the, cro of the cross. There are even some uh, commentaries that say after he'd killed Goliath, he cut off his head. He took his head. And where he had put that head, they say that is where there was Calvary. That is where Jesus was crucified. It just marked the end of the war. So this was really significant. All I'm trying to say is, when you get sent, when you are willing to go and do things for the Lord, there are some people that may try to discourage you. Don't stop there. Be as determined as David was. And then in First Samuel 17, verse 33, do you mind reading it, Esther? And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. If you want to carry on up to 33, please. Hmm? To, up to 38, okay. please. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep. And there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defiled the armies of the living God. David said, moreover, The Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he would deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the, and the Lord be with thee. And Saul so armed David with his armor, and he put a an helmet of brass upon his head. Also he armed him with a coat of mail. Thank you. And are you up to 38? Yes. Thank you. So, after word had been sent to King Saul about what David had said, Saul wanted to see David. And then he tried to discourage him as well. You know, you don't have any experience. And in those days, kings used to go to war with their armies. You don't have the experience. Do you think you can do this? This is the king. But David says, you know what? I had a fight with a lion and a bear that had attacked my sheep. And the God that delivered me from that lion and the bear is going to deliver me with this Philistine. Then King Saul says, okay, we'll give it a try then. And he says, but if you're going to fight the giant, you need to put on the gear, the right gear, because you don't just go to war. And he gives David what is expected of people to wear when they go to war. He gives him the helmet of brass. And they said they were very heavy helmets. They were not light. They used to weigh kilos. I don't know how, how much. Some of them apparently weighed even more than three kilograms. And all the mayo. In these days, we could say some uh, bulletproof jacket and all that. And they were heavy on little David. So David tried to walk in them. It didn't feel right. And he took them off. He thought, I don't need this. Because this war that I'm going on is not normal war. I know who I need to fight this war. Saul was trying to conform to what was the norm. 
He meant well when he gave this advice to David. But this was not a norm. It was a normal war. As you get sent by the Lord, there are some people that will expect you to conform to how things are supposed to be. And they will mean well, because that is how a lot of people have done it. But you need to remember that you are going out there with the Holy Spirit. The train that filled the temple in you is what is equipping you for this mission. You just need to align yourself with the Spirit of God and hear what he's saying and do as he says and let him lead you and you follow his steps. There is no norm to this. You just have to hear what God says and do as he says. Because what David did wasn't normal. A little boy going to war with someone that was all clad in a helmet, in a mail, had a spear, and he goes with a little stone. It was bizarre. It was weird. Maybe some people thought, is, is he okay in his head? And that is how it is. When we get sent to do the work of the Lord, we are not expected to be normal. After all, the word says we are peculiar people. We're going to do peculiar things when we work for the Lord. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying don't listen to advice. Because advice is good. But we have to use the spirit of discernment with the advice. We have to say, Lord, thank you for this advice, but what are you saying? And maybe we even need to ask for confirmation. We ask for the Lord to speak to a second or a third person. And then we say, yeah, this is you, God. One spoken, twice or third heard. And then we carry on. With, that, with what we are going to do. Now, we see Isaiah. He is willing to be sent. And as we can see from the book of Isaiah, he did a good job. I do think he did anyway. We are still reading about it now. He's changing lives now because he surrendered he was submissive to God and allowed God to send him. There are some people that God sent, but they didn't do the job properly. I was listening to someone, um, it was Bishop Joseph Gallington, when we went to the conference. And he, he taught from the, uh, the story of the miracle of wine at the wedding of Cana. He said, they kept pouring the wine in the pots. They kept pouring the wine. And he says, when did the wine stop flowing? And he says, it must have been when there weren't any more pots. That's when the wine stopped. When God sends us, he wants us to be a vessel. Because he, he, if he can trust us to go and do something for someone, then he will keep sending us. He will keep sending us. It's just like the parable of the, of the talents. The one person that kept it, it was taken away from him. Because they weren't meant to be kept. They were meant to be invested. They were meant to be used. They were meant to be multiplied. So if God sends us, we need to be workers and not just sit. Because there are so many Isaiahs out there that need to be touched. And those Isaiahs are waiting for you and me to go and touch them. With the fire that we get from the presence of God, as we hang out with the Lord here, the fire that we get, we sing, bring the fire down. It's not just for us. The fire is for us to go and start a revival and find Isaiahs out there that are going to change the world because we are workers. As much as we hang out with God, God wants us to do some work for him. I went somewhere and I was listening to someone. that um, The person told me to say they'd gone to London 
and somehow they went to they went to Buckingham Palace and then they went to Harrods. They got into Harrods and they say the Lord said, you know what, this is like Egypt. The Middle East does their trade here. It's like the capital city of Islam. And Islam, they are not they are not sitting back. They are so strategic. They just want to conquer the world. They want everyone to be Muslim. They are working. And that is what God wants us to do as Christians. They want us to work as hard, even harder than those people are doing. And she says, she got out of uh, Harrods. And then she says, she saw, she had a vision. She saw in the, in the clouds, somewhere the clouds opened. And she saw a man was riding on a white horse. He wore white clothes and he had a white turban, and the, the horse was going round and round, and in the vision, he saw it go round Bradford, go round Birmingham, and she said to the Lord, Lord, what is that? And God sort of brought it near, and, and they read the, the flag. The man was holding a flag in his hand, and apparently the flag said, Islam rules. Now, these are people that are so strategic. These are the dark forces, the principalities, the powers. They know they have to fight from the heavens. And as Christians, we are fighting from down here. How are we going to win? We need to know where we, we need to fight this war from. Someone is fighting, is, is throwing missiles from up the air, and someone is throwing stones from down here. How is that going to equate? These guys are strategic. Apparently, God also said to him, you know how they said Diana was killed by the M5 and the M6? Diana wasn't killed by the M5 or the M6. It was God who intervened. These guys are so strategic. Can you imagine this is a woman that even the government could not strip her of the title princess? That's how honorable she was. Can you imagine that child that was going to be born from the relationship of this woman? a Muslim child. Can you imagine how much influence that child would have had in this country? God said, no, this is a Christian country. I'm just trying to say we need to be strategic about the work that we need to do. There's a lot of work. We are soldiers, and soldiers don't sleep. They work day and night. Soldiers don't sleep. Could someone please read Esther again? Proverbs 11, verse 25. Thank you. The liberal soul shall be made fat, and he that watereth shall be watered also himself. Thank you. That's the bit that I wanted. Some versions say, who, he who refreshes others also gets refreshed. When God sends us on a mission, we also benefit from what we are doing from God. I'll give you an example of, say, suppose there's no central heating or there are no heaters and it's really, really cold. And I have a lot of hot water bottles that I need to give out to some people. And if I ask someone to get the hot water bottles and give them, they would, they would clutch them, wouldn't they? They would hold them like this while taking them to the person that I want them to deliver them to. And while they are holding the hot water bottle, they're also going to be warm, aren't they? So this person is going to be warm while they are going to deliver this hot water bottle. It's not their bottle, but they are also benefiting from it. And they will come back for another hot water bottle, and they will take it, and they will be warm. Now, suppose this person keeps that hot water bottle and doesn't take it to the person that I want them to take it to. Am I going to trust them again with another one? I won't, because they're not doing their job properly. And then the hot water bottle that they have, in the end, is going to get cold after some time. You understand what I'm trying to say? 
So if God, when God sends us, we benefit from being people that are working from, for God. And if we keep doing it, we gain his trust and he will keep providing, supplying through us for his kingdom. That is what I'm trying to say. Let us read Esther chapter 4, verse 14, the first part. Esther chapter 4, verse 14. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. Thank you. Do you have another version, please? That's King James. It's American Standard Version or something. Some simplified. Uh, or amplified, if you have. Yeah. Yeah, just read any other. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will, will rise for the Jews from another place. Thank you. If we keep silent, God's mission is not going to suffer. He's going to find someone else that will be willing to do it. And we are the ones that are not going to benefit from dwelling in his presence and doing things for him. God will ask us to do it. That's why it's up to us to say, yes, we are going to do it. But if we don't want to do it, he's not going to force us. He might encourage us like he did with Job. He wasn't a very good encouragement, was it? With Job. He encouraged him. But then again, he must have seen his heart, that his heart was submissive. So Job still ended up doing what God had wanted him to do. But what we need to know is God is not going to beg us. If we won't do it for him, he's got loads of children in the world that are willing to do things for him. And he will ask them. He will let them do it. And he will bless them. And he will refresh them as they are refreshing others. It is a privilege to do things for God. It's a privilege to be a servant of the Lord. It's an opportunity to work for the Lord but if we are not willing to do it, there will be someone else that will be. And I just want to say at this particular time, there's something happening in the UK. There's a revival that is about to break out. There are a lot of things happening. I think some of you have spoken to, you see there are some people that are coming from the other nations, people that have um, laid out some revivals. At this meeting where I was, there was um, John Arnott, this is the man that started the Toronto Blessing, if you've heard of it. It's now called the Catch the Fire. There's something God is doing in the, in the UK. Are you going to be a part of it? Are you going to be willing to work for the Lord? Are you going to be the one that is going here to say, here I am, send me, Lord? Because it, it is a privilege to do things for the Lord. It is a privilege to be a child of God. And as, it, as good as it is uh, to be in his presence to enjoy his presence, God wants us to work. He wants workers. And it's a lot easier to send someone when they are within your presence, when they dwell with you. When I'm at home, it's easier to just ask my children to do something than ask Amanda when Amanda is in here in, here, here in Nottingham because they are within my vicinity. So God is asking us to work for him. Because there's work out there. The harvest is ready, but the laborers are few. Now, from what I have said, I believe there's something for everyone here. Like I said, there's a word for someone, for everyone. Please just be alert. 
because verse 1 of Isaiah 6 says, In the year that Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon the throne. There are some people that have not seen the throne yet because there's another throne that is occupying them, that is keeping them busy. I pray that you ask for the grace of the Lord to kill the throne that is blocking you from encountering God so you can see the Lord that is sitting on the throne, the Lord God Almighty, whose train wants to fill your temple. He wants to be a part of you. He is the head and he wants his tail, his authority, his worship, his consecration to be in you. He wants you to make decisions with him. He says, come, come, let us reason together. He's not going to force you. He just wants to partner with you. So I want to ask you to go and ask the Lord to just kill that throne that is blocking your view of seeing the Lord that is on the throne. And then for those that have seen the throne, that have killed the throne that was blocking the view of God on the throne, I just want us to go and do a soul searching. Isaiah identified himself as someone with unclean lips. And he also dwelt amongst people that had unclean lips. Do you know that sometimes the people that we dwell amongst have a lot of influence on us? Sometimes we do the things that we do because of the people that we are dwelling amongst, the influence that they have. Because we have surrendered ourselves to them. Isaiah identified that as his weakness. And because he identified that, he confessed with his mouth, the Lord sorted it out. He sent a seraphim and he touched his lips and he purified him. And we see now Isaiah is running, working for God. And then there may be some people that may have been purified. They are in the presence of the Lord. They are enjoying themselves, you know. And God is saying, who shall I send? Who will go for us? But they're like, oh, it's, it's so nice to be here. It's so cool. I don't want to go there. There's a lot of aggression out there, you know. You stand on the, the street. People say things to you. You're at work. You want to mention the name of Jesus. They hush you. Don't say that. I used to say, why do you think it's wrong for me to talk about Jesus when you swear? Do you think it's all right for you to swear in front of me? Because I don't like swearing either, you know. But God is saying, okay, we are hanging out, we're cool, but would you do some work for me? So, like I have said, let's go home, have a sit down, let's, let this not end here. But let's this not, let this not end here. But let us do something about it. I just want us to pray now. I'm not going to lead the prayer. I want everyone to pray by themselves. With the pointers that I have mentioned I want us to ask for the grace the Lord to show us where we are. Is there a throne that is blocking our view of God? Or if the throne has been removed, what is it that we need to confess with our mouth that the, Lord's ne the Lord needs to touch so that we can be purified and we can be ready to work for God? Or if we have been purified and God is saying, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Are there some things that are maybe making us have some doubts? Do we have some aliabs in our lives that are saying, you shouldn't be doing that. It's not for you. You should be doing something else. Or are there some king souls that are saying, but you're only a little boy. You're not experiencing this business. Because... Uh, People normally go through training and they do this and they do that. They get equipped to do this. What makes you think you can do this? Or is it just the self? You are so choked in the things of this world and you don't think you could be used for God. 
like I said, if you're not willing, God is not going to beg you. There are other people that will go and work for God, that are going to give God a service, the Lord who is sitting on his throne. It's not enough to just have his train fill our temple. God wants people that are intimate with him, but working. Going out there to find Isaiah's who are going to start a revival. Going out there to find people that are hungry for God. And there are people that are hungry for God in this world. Because people are turning to drugs. People are turning to alcohol. People are going to mediums wanting to know what their dead relatives said. There is a lot of hunger there. But the hunger is being fed by something else. When we have what we need to feed that hunger. Where are you? I just want people to pray and ask for the grace. Ask for enlightenment. Ask for strength. And if we could just humble ourselves before God. So that he can send us. It's a privilege to work for God. It's a privilege to work for God. I want everyone to pray now. Because I'll pray for myself as well.
word does not return to you void. And may the word that has been spoken, Lord, accomplish that what you have sent it to do in the mighty name of Jesus. I declare that there are going to be soldiers arising from this house for your kingdom, Lord. I ask for the grace to empower everyone. I ask for wisdom. I ask for strength. Give us a, a hunger, a thirst to work for you. In the mighty name of Jesus.